this afternoon. Uh, we're going to have a conversation about the rise of city-states and what that means, what the implications are for, uh, for security, for democracy, and for, for foreign policy. How do we navigate in this more complex environment where we have multiple actors at the national and at the subnational level? And, uh, you know, if you think about this phenomenon, Asia is really where you start to see this trend manifest in ever more compelling ways. And so we have with us today two very distinguished guests to talk about that, uh, that phenomenon, how they see that impacting uh, governance and economic uh, relations in, in, the, in the portfolios that they manage. We have with us uh, Minister of State for Urban Development for India, the Honorable Minister Hardeep Singh Puri, who many of you know from his very distinguished career in the Foreign Service and the, and the positions that he has held with such distinction um, as ambassador to the UK and also most recently uh, as India's ambassador to the United Nations. So it's, uh, it's really truly a delight to see him take on this very important role now in India on urban development and we look forward to hearing from him particularly on many of the challenges and also the initiatives and opportunities that he is uh, shepherding. Uh, we are joined also from Australia by the premier uh, of Victoria Province, Premier Daniel Andrews. Uh, Premier Andrews hails from the Labor Party and has, uh, has in his purview one of the uh, fastest growing cities in Australia, which is the city of Melbourne, which is Australia's second largest city, but soon, soon to become the largest city overtaking Sydney and one that is experiencing dynamic growth, both in population and in economic opportunity, uh, and all of the different uh, challenges and opportunities that he's overseeing as he does, uh, as, he, as he governs and, and, and manages um, that. And so, without further ado, what I would like to do is invite uh, Minister Puri to make some opening comments, and then I'll turn to uh, Premier Andrew, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have the, the conversation. And I'm going to also try to engage all of you in the room and, and uh, uh, invite you to also pose your, your comments and questions as well. So, Minister Puri, welcome, and uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Nisha. Thank you for having me on this panel along with yourself and Premier. Um, let me try and outline for you, and I do this with full disclosure, I'm only four months into the job. Uh, I'm still learning, but what I have discovered so far, uh, I'm, that knowledge I'm going to utilize to outline the challenge of urbanization that India faces. I know it's not uh, advisable to throw statistics at a uh, highly evolved, cerebrally evolved audience like this, participating audience, but I think some statistics will be helpful. Uh, when we became an independent country in 1947, 17% of India lived in urban spaces. But remember, that was 17% on a population base of about 300 million. The population of Delhi in 1947, before it uh, received hundreds of thousands of people as part of the ravages of the partition, it was less than 1 million. It was 800,000. According to the latest estimates that I have of the population of Delhi, it should be around 19 million. 18.6 million is the figure I have for 2016. If you combine that with the population of the other parts of Delhi, which are popularly referred to as the national capital region, which includes parts of the cities of, uh, in uh, the states of Uttar Pradesh, Haryana, and Rajasthan, I'm afraid, Premier, that takes me in the national capital region over, well over the kind of uh, figures for the nation states that we, we are normally talking about. Now, that's the situation today. What is it likely to be in 2030? In 2030, something like 
or even higher of Indians will live in urban spaces and that would mean something like 600 million people or thereabouts. Between now and 2030, we have to construct something like 600 600 cities. Six, no, no, you have to construct something like 700 to 900 million square meters mm. of commercial and re residential space between now and 2030. Wow. So the point I'm making is 70% of the India of 2030 has not even been built yet. That is the enormity of the challenge we've got. A few more uh, statistics to provide a perspective. 65% of India's GDP comes from the cities. The cities account for something like 90% of tax receipts. Now, you have a situation in which 60, 65% of India lives in what are called rural areas, but the contribution of agriculture to the GDP is only about 14.6%. So is it any surprise that people are getting up from uh, the, the rural areas and autonomously moving into the cities. Now, some Western commentators used to describe us as, um, and I don't know whether the term fits or not, reluctant urbanizers. I think urbanization in India is sui generis. It's one of a kind. We have a very large population base, and the cities, in fact, constitute the solution to India's economic growth. Already 60% of GDP, 90% of tax receipt. So that's the kind of challenge that we face. And I think the Prime Minister's three programs, flagship programs, which I have the privilege of dealing with uh, in my ministry, uh, the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana or the affordable housing, which means we have to build 11 million uh, units by 20. 22, and um, the Swachh Bharat campaign, and more than that, the smart cities. So I'm going to conclude with half a minute on the smart cities. I'm often asked, why only 100? To which my response is, you know, if it were an ideal world where you had limit, uh, unlimited resources, you could probably do many more. But we have 4,041 cities in India. The idea is to get these 100 well and running uh, with smart solutions, which is a huge business opportunity. We're talking about, what, $30 billion in the first instance. But each smart city will have a lighthouse effect. From there you will go, the other cities will want to do this, and there's a series of urban challenges which we are in the process of um, uh, addressing, and I have absolutely no doubt we'll get this one right. I think we're on the cusp of the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is all about urban services. And again, I have no doubt that it will be win-win for India. Thank you, Minister. You touched on a lot of very interesting uh, trends and issues that emerge. And I think as we take the conversation to Premier Andrews, you know, we can talk about how Melbourne's growth is also creating in interesting opportunities, but also interesting challenges. Yeah, um, and yeah, turn it over nature. to you. Alicia, thank you very much for uh, being here. And Minister, it's great, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, think about a dialogue that's talking about uh, geopolitical, strategic, security issues, as well as issues of economic growth, issues of equity, and the disruptive force that is technology and connectivity, and to include sub-sovereign governments and cities, great cities of the world. I think that's a proper, a proper, uh, a proper form formation of the sort of discussion that we should be having. Now, I can't boast anywhere near the statistics that the Minister has just gone through. The scale of Indian expansion and growth at urbanisation is truly uh, profound. But it, and it does present some opportunities for friends and partners, and that's one of the reasons why um, I'm here with some of my colleagues uh, to launch our own India strategy. So the State of Victoria has developed a strategy that's all about uh, closer economic ties, cultural ties. We're already very good friends, but we can become partners, I think, particularly in dealing with some of those challenges that the Minister has just outlined. But from my point of view, as the fastest growing city, the fastest growing state in our country, both in economic terms as well as in the size of our, our main city, Melbourne, and indeed other regional capitals and the entire population of Victoria, Nisha's right, it does present great challenges. 
The alternative, of course, is to be not growing, uh, and that's, that has an altogether more difficult set of challenges, I think, to be dealing with. But we face, on a very different scale, many of the same challenges. Build the infrastructure that the community needs, provide the services that the community demands, create jobs, try and be as equitable as you can be, all within a, a framework where resources are always limited. There's always a, an important opportunity cost. Investments are made in one place, mean you can't make investments elsewhere. But if you have a strong balance sheet, if you have a strong credit rating, if you have uh, a work ethic and I think sub-sovereign governments bring an urgency and an absolute immediacy that sometimes national governments can't, uh, we, we have less questions to answer and we're far less concerned about process niche than we are about getting outcomes. Uh, the retail nature of politics and public administration at a local level means that there's no choice but to actually deliver for people. So growth is good. Uh, it does present some challenges. The way to deal with that is to have a clear plan, have strong partnerships, recognise that even though we are a sub-sovereign region, uh, a city-state for want of a better term, we can still be forward-facing to the world, we can still seek partnerships and growth, we can still be part of an agenda uh, that is disruptive in and, in and of itself, in that the way international geopolitics is written, the way fo foreign policy rules are written, players of a sub-sovereign nature are not supposed to be on the field. Uh, that presents some disruptive ch challenges as well. But again, uh, these are all uh, really important opportunities. If you just spend long enough thinking about those challenges, you can turn them into the opportunities that you know they can be. Nothing like the scale of the challenge the minister has put forward, but again, uh, our growth challenge and delivering and being continuing to have that community permission to keep delivering, uh, I think we're best placed to do it because we're a government that is local and a government that's proximate to the challenges that we face. I'm going to ask you to comment on two, uh, two potential phenomena this presents and then I'm going to turn it to our audience to uh, invite them to ask questions. Um, one is, you know, you talked about how the, the rising importance of these cities, they become economic forces in their own right. And so you start to see the economic policies manifest as, as I think you were commenting earlier, trade agreements are made by the central government, the national government, but they're implemented Indeed. by the subnational. And so that puts a lot more burden of responsibility for the subnational leaders to be out there uh, drawing in the investment and, and engaging. And I'd love to hear how you think about that, you know, from that perspective. Well, well, well let, let me begin, Minister. And you can, Nisha, the, the, the issue for us, if you look at an Australian context, through the 80s and the early 90s, we had a wave of economic reform. We floated our dollar, we de deregulated our banks, we dealt with a whole lot of trade and tariff barriers. They were all levers that could only be pulled by a truly national government. If you now look at the next wave of reform, real productivity enhancing reform, they're not so much challenges that can be met at the national level. They're about health, they're about education and skills, about the formation of knowledge and the important application of that knowledge. They're about uh, the implementation of national policy. The big productivity levers, at least in our circumstance, are very much at that sub sovereign level. Uh, the point I was making earlier on before we came on stage, uh, all too often, and they're a good thing, and Australia has been very successful in recent times to negotiate a number of free trade agreements that are, they have potential that is almost unknown. In, in decades to come, we'll look back, I think, with a real sense of pride that we were able to negotiate those. And, and, and an India-Australia free trade agreement will be one of those. We have some things to work through, but we'll get there. I'm very confident of that. The implementation or the realisation of the opportunities that lie within a free trade agreement is always left to firms and to sub-sovereign governments who are about delivering the produce, delivering all the capability that lies underneath realising those free trade agreements. And that, of course, by which I mean skills, human capital, and setting the scene, creating the ecosystems where people can then take advantage of all the barriers that have been moved to one, to one side. Uh, you would expect me to be buoyant and optimistic about the role of governments like the one that I lead, but I think it is a truly exciting time in the delivery of agendas set by others formally, but agendas that we play an active role in setting as well. Minister, how do you foresee well, without, that? Without doubt, the 
making of foreign and security policy is the preserve of the center. Um, negotiating trade agreements, again, is something that the central government has to do. But I don't see any conflict here. I don't see the uh, cities. And you know, cities don't have walls, and they don't have boundaries. Some cities grow into 20 million, uh, 25 million megapolises. Uh, but as the Premier says, uh, the central government can negotiate a trade agreement either bilaterally or a trade deal as part of the multilateral negotiations in the World Trade Organization, or a plurilateral agreement outside, or a free trade agreement between uh, India and ASEAN, India and Australia, whatever. But it still has to be implemented. Now, much of that implementing gravitas is provided by economic actors strewn all over the country. And that's where the city-state city becomes important. In the, in the case of India, I mean, I'm aware of uh, Gujarat conducting uh, vibrant Gujarat summit since 2003. And uh, Gujarat is not the only state in India which is uh, trying to attract foreign direct investment. They're doing very well at it. I mean, other states are doing it. And I don't want to name them in, because I'm a central minister. I, I don't want to be doing, doing the grading. But some are doing it more successfully, others are. And I think that fits into the kind of cooperative federalism that the prime minister's outlined. So my response to that is, I do not visualize the states or the city states doing anything which would appear to run counter to, or in which there would be a discord in terms of the agreements negotiated by the center. Clearly, foreign and security policy in our constitution, as I believe, yes. Premier, and yours, is the preserve of the central government. But within that, you have to make economic processes work. Now, I come to another aspect, if I have your uh, permission. Please. You know, you're talking about cities which become global cities. They are part of what I call the global value chain. Now you have a city which uh, uh, undertakes, let's say, production. Uh, let, let's take uh, San Francisco and the West Coast. That's one. You take other big cities, London, Paris, uh, New York. I mean, you might have the central government located there. In London, Paris, and um, let's say Moscow, New York, I still don't know where it is located. I mean, I, if you permit me, whether it's in Washington, New York, but I think just now it's in Washington. But let me come back to that. Surely the city of London has a very important role to play. The mayor has a very ro important role to play. But I'm sure the mayor, if he belongs to the same party as the central government, uh, he or she will be taking extra step. You occasionally get uh, governments which belong to different political persuasion. And uh, we have a case like that. But they try to do policy independently, but I think that the people, you know, the mass is wiser than the, uh, you know, they take over. But I think in the coming years, you will find economic actors in cities, city states, through trade agreements of the kind that Premier mentions, but I think also other global processes becoming more and more important. And I think the central government, as is the case in India, will be taking extra care to involve the states both for the staging of events and for the acceleration of economic processes. Nisha, there's an interesting, given that the minister mentioned the United States, uh, there's an interesting example in recent times following the United States withdrawal from the Paris Agreement targets. We saw, I'm not sure what the collective noun would be, but we saw many, many governors, uh, to give a few examples, the governors of New York, California, uh, Washington State, many others, stand up and say, well, we as sovereign states, we will play our part to meet those targets as if that national decision had not been uh, taken. That's one example. Uh, increasingly, there may be more and more of those examples, and that maybe tests a little bit the notion that some areas are clearly the province of the national government, and others can be left uh, to the private sector or to sub-sovereign governments or indeed cities. That tension climate is... Change, climate change clearly is an important yeah. uh, multilaterally negotiated instrument in which the stakeholders are not just the government, citizens, etc. Exactly. So the mayors and governors and others, in response, I think, that's my understanding, to the aspirations of their own citizens on whom they are dependent for support, uh, if they see a step being taken by the central government, yes, they'll articulate a position which is different. And also, I would say, you know, as, as the global economics become more and more competitive and compelling, there are also foreign policy implications for city-states and for sub-national governments that 
uh, have deep economic consequences. And so mm. that clear, bright line, Minister, that you talked about, that uh, foreign policy is the province of the center, um, becomes blurred a little bit when you start to see economic implications of foreign policy positions and, and the impact on uh, states and subnational governments. Nisha, if you take foreign policy uh, in terms of definition on a wider canvas uh, beyond security and foreign policy in the political sense, I think you're right. Uh, I was taking a very narrow definition of it. I don't think any state in India, any city in India would want to, for instance, determine what the contours of our policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Pakistan should be. I don't think. I mean, some of the neighboring states may have a nuance or two to uh, introduce here and there. When it comes to economic processes, I mean, whatever terms of uh, engagement the central government negotiates, those have to be implemented by the states. I mean, there may be artisans in Gujarat, there may be in Tamil Nadu, they have to. If there's a global value chain being developed, they're very much part of it. So you can negotiate whatever trade agreement you like, but the uh, you know, multilateral and uh, multinational entities will have their own sourcing, et cetera. So in any ways, they're already participating in economic processes. Mm. And I think a modern nation, a nation state has the flexibility and resilience to adjust to that. Indeed. Um, if, uh, if you're interested in asking a question, there are some microphones uh, that I think are, are put in the aisles. And so if you, if you can make your way to one of these microphones, um, You'll see one right behind you at this table. And okay, why don't you start? Is it on? Yeah. Can you speak up? Yes. Well, I'm not sure that I got the full thrust of the question because of the audio levels, but let me repeat what I heard. One is time frame, two is the role of foreign direct investment and the participation of uh, uh, economic entities from outside India. All right. Uh, I like to say that the 100 smart cities which we are dealing with, which is a program which commenced actually in June of 2014, because this government, Prime Minister Modi's government was uh, elected and sworn in in May 2014, started one month later. Uh, two and a half years from there, we already have 90 cities identified. We have projects, projects worth about $30 billion, which are in the pipeline. A fraction of that tendering has been done. And I think from about June 2018, that is this year, you will begin to see the physical contours of the first smart cities. And, and let me clear a few uh, uh, ideas. It's not something which will drop from uh, the heaven in terms of sci-fi, you know, et cetera. Much of this is redevelopment of existing uh, cities. Uh, it will have um, uh, all that is required to produce what is called ease of living, especially for the poorer people, for women, for the differently abled, and so on and so forth. How long is this pro program for the first 100. First of all, 90 cities are already declared, declared through a competition. They had to bid for it. And there was a scientific process, uh, objective process of evaluation and selection. I'm in the process of announcing, rather we finalized the next 10, almost finalized, and within the next week or so, we'll announce the remaining 10. This program, I think, is scheduled to run in terms of current levels of investment and um, participation till about 2022 or something, but I already anticipate great pressure coming from other states and cities saying, why not us? Because I believe these smart cities will have what is called a lighthouse effect. You know, you get one on, it starts to beam, and then others all want to be like it. So it's a first tranche of a process, if I may be permitted to say that. But it will require massive amounts of investment. It will require urban local bodies to raise their own 
and I, I, I should not say this, but I will, our urban local bodies are not used to independently floating bonds, etc. They've been used to, you know, um, the state and the central government uh, giving them um, the resources. I think that's about to change. Uh, we are coming up with all kinds of new innovative ideas, including the ranking of cities, including one which I'm going to announce in a few days' time. So, you know, if you want to look good, you better get your act right. And when you get your act right, you're able to float municipal bonds for 1,000 crores if some, some municipalities are doing. The involvement of uh, foreign economic entities, I have good news there. The figures I have uh, as of this evening, that something like 42 world-class companies, gilt-edged ones, from 14 countries are already either have got contracts or are in the process of being announced. So there is a massive win-win opportunity for business from outside India. So I take all of you who are here this evening to take the message back that the smart city process in India has just begun. We welcome foreign participation. It's, there's nothing on nomination basis, because that's not how we run it, but we will uh, create the narrative for you to come and bid in these processes, and many of the, um, the best companies in the world are already in the fray. So I hope I've captured the, um, the different elements of the question. Thank you. Thank you. I have a gentleman in the back there. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, it's a brilliant question, but, you know, if I were to answer all parts of it, we'd be here for a while. But let me try and answer it. Look, it's not one scheme. Uh, there are several schemes in operation simultaneously. We have a scheme called Amrut, for instance, which has 500 cities uh, involved. It's a massive scheme. It involves providing water uh, taps and connections and dealing with sewage issues. Uh, we have a Swachh Bharat scheme, uh, a Swachh Bharat mission, which has to be completed by, um, uh, you know, 2nd October 2019, which would be the 150th birth anniversary of the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, who incidentally talked about Swachhta and sanitation before he talked about political emancipation uh, a year prior to that. Uh, according to that, we have to build uh, urban toilets, rural toilets. I'm confident as the minister for the urban uh, areas, that we'll get that scheme done one year before 2019. We'll get it done next year. So the physical targets will be met. Now whether, and I'm, I'm hoping that the 500 Amrut cities, incidentally, by 31st March of 2018, which is uh, two months from now, we will have online pol uh, property clearances done all online for all 500 uh, city. So there's a tremendous amount of work which is going on. Whether this will result in the number of people leave, leaving the rural areas uh, to come to the cities to look for jobs, I do not know. My own sense is that some of the peers, uh, you know, problems we are facing on account of rural distress, it's not because there is a real problem. Sometimes it can be an unintended uh, effect of something. Let me tell you, in a recent election I found, I looked at the figures in a particular state, what had happened is we had actually got good amount of water into that district. What happened, because the water was there, there was a bumper cotton crop. Because there was a bumper crop, the price dropped. Now, what you have to do at the end of the day in addressing agrarian or rural distress is to make sure that money goes into the pockets of the people who are doing that economic activity. So when you're dealing with a scale of the kind that we have to in India, it's a large exercise, but I'm confident, again, you may not be able to reverse it, but you can arrest the growth. Then you also come up with the creation of new cities so that the infrastructure which is under strain in a city like Delhi, for instance. But here again, we have the problem of unauthorized colonies. I personally see the problem getting controlled when we are coming up with land pooling. There'll be less demand for going into an unauthorized colony. And hopefully, with all these measures together, we can correct the situation. In the back there, and then and then the 
lady uh, in front of you. So yeah. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, you've just spoken about the increasing importance of cities uh, uh, across the world. Do you think that in India it is time that we have directly elected mayors who are much more independent, both financially as well as in terms of their functions? Thank you. Even at the risk of making a statement which may politically sound incorrect, I think you're bang on. The cities I've lived in, London, uh, New York, you know, New York had a problem with the uh, crime scene, Ca along comes Giuliani and cleans it out. Uh, if you, and that's possible when you have a directly elected mayor, etc. I think we will move to that situation as time passes. I think people will just have to get used to the idea that when you have a large city, 18, 20 uh, million people, you cannot have a multiplicity of layers, you know, a central government, a state government, a lieutenant governor, a mayor elected only for one year. So I realize I'm sticking my neck out a bit, but let me qualify that as my personal view. I say, yes, when you're dealing with the kind of urban challenges that we do have, it's better to have a directly elected mayor for stable extended durations. Let me ask uh, Premier Andrews if you want to maybe take a crack at that as well, the dynamic with the uh, city mayor of Melbourne and, and, and your role in trying to navigate that. So, Anusha, we have a, a directly elected mayor in Melbourne, and then the rest of the mayors across um, 79 other councils are elected by the councillors. So the council, a group of, say, 12 councillors, elect the mayor on an annual basis. Look, the, the key point is this. It, everyone's got a role to play provided they know what their responsibilities are, provided they know exactly what their role in the team effort is, if there's a clear, a clear and evolving understanding of what your responsibilities are, then multiple levels of government can work together uh, and can deliver the outcomes that you want for your citizens, for your ratepayers, for, uh, for your nation and for your uh, partners. Uh, some of the points that the Minister's made about that, com well, it's cooperative federalism, but there's a competitive edge to it as well. Yeah, and it includes not just the national government of India and states, it includes cities as well. Uh, this notion about cities lifting their game potentially, uh, having a greater economic focus, raising their own capital, uh, suddenly playing in spaces that they've never played in before, that's ultimately the point that we've been discussing tonight. It's about new levels of government stepping up, uh, having uh, partnerships and relationships being involved in parts of the economy and parts of the geopolitical that they have never been part of. Um, we've kind of segued quite nicely back to where we started. If you build a competitive model, then you are essentially saying to all actors within it, go out and do your best. Go out and attract as much support as possible. We didn't have to be told this in my state. Uh, we have the largest network of overseas officers second only to the Australian Foreign Service, 22 officers around the world. Uh, they're not burdened by the challenges of foreign policy, as the Minister indicated. They're about, about partnerships and relationships, trade. Uh, they're about, ultimately, economic activity. And it's about enhancing our ability to compete within the federalism that we have to work in. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about us making the most of every economic opportunity that comes, comes, our, comes our way. Uh, back to your point about mayors. Uh, again, if people are clear on what their roles are, then you can have multiple levels of government all working towards a common set of goals. Now, Premier, I'm in a mood where I agree with everything that everybody's saying. But one small point, <laughs> small, small point. You see, when you have multiple... I've never met a national minister that agreed with everything I said, <laughs> no, ever. No, but ever. You, you, know, you, know, you know, Premier, uh, the s small downside to this is when you have multiple levels and the role is not clearly defined, I mean, we have a problem. We, the Supreme Court is hearing a case as to what the relative powers of the Lieutenant Governor are vis-a-vis -vis the other. And this is because we're a democracy. You know, you have a set of guidelines, and you've got Samir sitting there and me. We are great friends, but we may have a slightly different interpretation. And, and you know, it, it, gets, it can become a tough issue. What I'm saying is if you have a clearly defined role of a mayor, as in London and in New York, those are the two cities mm -hmm. I know reasonably well, you will not have to then uh, feel that you are vulnerable to a point of interpretation yes, or a turf issue. So the, in order to put the turf out, you can have the same other way, the central government, state government, each doing its own job, but you have a directly elected mayor who says the buck stops here. Well, uh, I think on that note of the buck stops here, I see the boss here, Samir. 
uh, giving us the sign because I know everyone is waiting to go into the dinner session. But this is such a rich topic. I imagine we could talk for, for much longer and still not exhaust all of the uh, issues here that we want to explore.